Hi there! Today we're going to go over some changes that DPI has put out with recent document updates regarding the Educational Interpreter Evaluation and Rubric. And so the role of the interpreter and the evaluation rubric are documents that are hand in hand in developing and promoting the profession of educational interpreting. So I have here with me my director, Julie Homa. Uh, Julie, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Julie Homa. I am the current outreach director for West DHH. My background is as an educational interpreter and also a teacher for the deaf at the residential school and mainstream uh, settings, a special ed teacher, and now I hold a uh, director of special education license. All right, thank you for joining me, Julie. And again, my name is Keith Burasek. I'm the interpreter specialist at Outreach. And so my background is also educational interpreting. I worked in a district in Northern Wisconsin for several years and then um, worked to get uh, my bachelor's degree and also my community interpreting license and have been a part of outreach since 2018 and have also been involved with NAIE, the National Association of Interpreters in Education in various roles with their organization. So I'm really excited to see these changes and to see the impact this will make on the interpreting profession as a whole, and also ultimately the services that our DHH and deafblind students are getting in Wisconsin. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the student and making sure that they have everything that they need in order to access their education and be successful. Mm -hmm. And the quality services. And so the two documents that we DPI have brought forth and have updated were created in 2013. Again, it's the role of the educational interpreter and an evaluation rubric for evaluating the interpreters in the field that they're working in. And so the language it needed to be updated. It was, when it was created, it was relevant, but because of the recent licensure changes that educational interpreting has gone through and also just the development of the profession itself. We needed to take a look at this again and revise some of the content to reflect the current practices. And so we had several key stakeholders take part in promoting and showing and discussing the relevant roles that interpreters do and also who supervises them and why. And so Julie, would you be able to go through uh, some of the uh, pertinent roles and who was part of these, who was involved in these changes? Sure. So first and foremost, I just want to explain kind of how government works um, in terms of education. So we have a state superintendent's advisory council, uh, deaf, hard of hearing programs. And that advisory council advises the state superintendent on changes of law, changes of guidances, procedures, as it relates to deaf education. And the request to update these documents came as a request from the um, advisory council. At that time, the advisory council formed a work group and this work group worked the entire school year um, last year, updating and going through each of these two documents. That work group consisted of an audiologist, a speech and language pathologist, several teachers of the deaf, several educational interpreters, and also outreach staff members, Keith and I were involved in that. Outside of the DH Council and the work group, um, we also involved Wisconsin stakeholders. And those, again, are the professionals that serve professionals and families, parents, kids who serve um, students with hearing loss in the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. We use the Claire Center resources related to um, recommendations for educational interpreters in K-12 settings. Mm -hmm. And then we also um, use the National Association of Interpreters in Education, NAIE documents and guidelines that they have. So the work that you, the revisions that you see um, come from the request of the DHH Council, but really align with state and national guidelines. And it's a very comprehensive, well-rounded group that the stakeholders and everyone involved really wanted to get 
a well-rounded perspective on what educational interpreting is today, not just in Wisconsin, but nationwide. Absolutely. So what are those changes? There are quite a few uh, to those documents, and this one in particular, the role of the educational interpreter. So again, if you're looking at the bulletins, it was 13.03. The revisions are included in the new bulletin, which is 21.02. And so I, we're, we picked five that we're going to kind of elaborate on, uh, but there are several others that, I'm, that are well worth checking out. The first one we want to reiterate is the IEP team membership. It's so important that uh, interpreters are included in the goals of a student and able to be involved and get that information so they can better provide the services that they're asked to perform from the IEP itself. And as a team member, that's an important part, being involved in the educational team as an equal member of that team. So the next... I know some. Mm -hmm. Sorry, ahead, I know sometimes educational interpreters. You kind of have to interpret for the IEP meeting, mm -hmm. especially if your student is in the IEP meeting. Yeah. So if you do have to interpret for an IEP meeting, it's this just clarifies how important it is to for the team to gather your input input and feedback prior to the IEP meeting, so your voice is heard at, within that meeting. And I've done that when I worked as an educational interpreter in a written letter or just feedback on the goals from the DHH teacher. We're sitting down before the meeting and just sharing your thoughts. And then someone can share that on your behalf while you're providing the services. But that that second point, that second question is, again, to re-emphasize the importance of your involvement on in the IEP team for the benefit of the student you're working with. So... Number six is related to working with the DHH teacher. Now, the DHH teacher may be someone in your building. They may be someone itinerant who you may not see as often as you uh, see the student on a daily basis. And so you may be asked to provide tutoring. You may be asked or there, that need may arise as long as you're working with a teacher and with the supervision of a DHH teacher, those services can be provided. Uh, and it's important that you're on the same page with the DHH teacher and the goals that are being implemented because it, with any student, the more cohesive the team, the more successful the outcome for the student. Well, and we also know that sometimes a teacher of the deaf is just a consultant and they just may come in mm. once a month yep. to see a student. And so um, when asked to provide tutoring, it's important that it's related to the expertise of the educational interpreter, which is language, mm. vocabulary, ASL, English. That's really the, the wheelhouse of an educational interpreter. And many times they work under the direction of a regular ed teacher or a special ed teacher in the building. That's actually more common these days, I think. And um, so tutoring, right. yes, as long as it's within the wheelhouse, the, expert, the expertise of the educational interpreter. Um, and it's guided and directed by a teacher, a licensed teacher, whether it's the teacher for the deaf, special ed teacher, or a regular education teacher. Again, working as a team, a collaborative approach is so important to the success of the student, as well as the success of the IEP, the goals that are set forth for that student. The other portion that we want to look at is number seven, the non-interpreting duties. And there we did receive a lot of feedback on this uh, question and took all of that into consideration and we looked at what interpreters are expected or not expected to do again those duties may depend on the environment elementary middle high school preschool those kind of things and the duties are okay if you're with the caveat of not interfering with the services needed to be provided. So if you're you know, with a student in a class and then asked to cover lunch duty, that's not okay. But if those duties can be provided as parallel services, the student's already outside on recess duty, and you're available to provide services as needed, that's okay. We, you're a part of the school 
body, the you're working there as an educational team member, you're a part of the classroom environment. So you're all those duties as assigned are relevant and can be very beneficial to a student in the lunchroom, in recess duty, on bus duty, to be available and to support the school building and the morale of the school as a whole. And I think what's important for an interpreter is when asked to do the duties, make sure the supervisor, your supervisor is aware that, okay, but if there is an emergency where I have to interpret for a student that I will need to go. So I can't Mm -hmm. have responsibility of supervision of other students in, in a case, in a case by case basis. So yes, I can help with supervising playground, but Just know if I have an interpreting need, I have to go. So don't rely on me for the supervision of other students. A key part of that is communication between you and a supervisor and the expectations of the team members and what they have of you. And uh, this document can help support and defend this discussion. Uh, Bring it up when a supervisor uh, sit down if you need to and have that open conversation. And with that, everyone's expectations will all be out on the table and it will create a, a more positive work environment too because all of the expectations are laid out. One other uh, point we'd like to highlight here is number 14, explanation of support services, including multiple support systems. The students we often work with today usually have a myriad of technology and services provided, and all of those things come into play along with providing interpretation. And all of those can work cohesively, and it's important to consider the content of the class the concepts taught. The role of the interpreter is still key to provision of services and clarification of content and support of that content. Again, working collaboratively with the educational audiologist, the DHH teacher, the general education teacher, building into the environment advocacy skills, whether the student has you know, a CI or DM or any other assistive devices to help even with assessment or clarification of their use and also clarification of what's happening in the classroom. Students may be getting only a part of that information or understanding a part of it, but in your role, you can help bridge those gaps and support the student ultimately to be successful and to work together. And so you think about all of the concepts a student is learning in a classroom these days. Some of them as the student progresses can become more and more abstract. And so clarification and multiple ways of exposing the student to that concept, that abstract thought is so key. And that's where your role as an interpreter becomes even more relevant, even with the support of technology. Again, that's a discussion with your IEP team and working together to support the goals of the student. And the stakeholders for number 14, really this came from um, stakeholders being faced with, well, this child has a cochlear implant, so they don't need an interpreter. And so this is this is that number that explains, yeah, sometimes they do. They do, mm-hmm. you know, no matter the assistive technology, the personal listening devices that a student is using, they absolutely can and do benefit from an educational interpreter as well, as decided by the IEP team. Mm-hmm. And again, again, a collaborative approach to providing services is so important. And often those services can be provided parallel to each other and then support them symbiotically. And it really comes down to the benefit of the student and the family and the IEP team. And the last thing we really want to emphasize is this clarification. It's number 18, supervisor for ed interpreters. This After discussing this with the team and looking at documentation from other states as well as national organizations, it became very apparent that we needed to emphasize who would be supervising educational interpreters. Now, as an equal member of the IEP team, 
DHH teachers, educational interpreters, if there's if DHH teachers or any other professional on that team is supervising educational interpreters, it creates a conflict of interest. It's uh, they're not an equal member of that team. Then the best scenario would be to have an administrator with a background in evaluation supervising the interpreters. Now, one of the things that came up during the discussion was, well, what if they don't know any of the background? They don't, a uh, principal or admin is not going to know sign language. They're not going to know the ins and outs of the profession. But as an evaluator, the tools we've provided and worked through creating create an opportunity to look at how the interpreter works as a team member. And so that rubric that we've developed is really will support the administrators who are evaluating the interpreters. Julie, do you have any comments about eva the evaluation at, tool? At the, yes, at the end of the day, educational professionals need to be evaluated by an administrator with an administrative license who's trained and qualified and licensed to provide evaluations to staff. And so for, for me, um, as a special ed director, uh, it's imperative that staff, including educational interpreters, are providing an evaluation by someone who is licensed in order to do in order to do that. So that is the same as any of the other professionals that work in the school. So educational interpreters absolutely should be no different. Right. So this document supports that. And so now we're going to move on to the evaluation rubric that then supports that finding. And so the evaluation rubric for educational interpreters has also been updated to reflect that perspective. Julie, is there, I'm going to let you take the lead here on some of those changes. Yes, absolutely. So um, the evaluation tool before, um, it was it was from a lens of you're not good enough, how can we improve you? And, and that's from an outside perspective. So whoever was filling out that tool, they were kind of deciding any everything without really that personal growth and the growth mindset of the professional themselves. So it was revamped to really follow educator effectiveness. And at, Education administ administrators in schools are very familiar with educator effectiveness. And so that administrator now would have this and they will be able to familiarize with, with an educational interpreter because it is aligned with educator effectiveness, really with the growth mindset of the interpreter doing self-reflection mm -hmm. and growing professionally on their own instead of someone just telling them the good, the good, the bad, and the ugly, which we all know it's just all good. Um, and and uh, as an educational interpreter, we're already fulfilling the skill requirements by satisfying licensure. So all of those things that were in the original rubric about, you know, are we performing our duties, our skills, those kind of things, those are all included in our licensure requirements. So we have that, that skill portion is already present. So it's more about our yeah. work as being yeah. an effective educator. Yes, ab absolutely. You know, so your evaluator does not have to know sign language anymore. They don't have to know the intricacies of deaf education. I think it's a great opportunity for the educational interpreter to, to, to teach and expand their knowledge, um, but it's not a necessity for them to evaluate you. Um, this tool also is aligned with other related service providers like your OT, your PT, speech and language, that kind of thing. And so on the educator effectiveness, there will be the educator, educational interpreter um, evaluation, and you will see it aligned with all of the other related service providers. And um, just emphasizing again, uh, an administrator should be evaluating an educational interpreter and not a teacher or someone who is within that IEP team. Hmm. And it can, it reflects to the focus on student support and the goals, the success we want to see of the student is then reflected in the teaming, the educational team, 
the effectiveness that they have as a team working collaboratively. And so this document, the evaluation rubric, and the role of the interpreter really go hand in hand in helping to create and foster an environment of cohesion and support for the students that we're working with. So we hope you take a look at these documents and are able to use them in the work that you're doing. And so thanks for watching. Thank you.